Maniac McGee by Jerry Spinelli. Chapter 37. Thus began a series of heroic feats by Maniac McGee. At 20 paces, he hit a telephone pole with a stone 61 times in a row. When the once-a-week freight train hit Elm Street, he started running from the Oriole Street dead end, on one rail, and beat the train to the park, no sweat. He took off his sneaks and socks and walked, nonchalant as you please, through the rat-infested dump at the foot of Rocco Hill. The mysterious hole down by the creek, the one you would never reach into, even if you dropped your most valuable possession into it, he stuck his hand in, his arm in, all the way to the elbow, kept it there for the longest 60 seconds on record, and pulled it out, dirty but still full of fingers. He climbed the fence the American bison pen at the zoo. He had suggested this feat himself, everyone else scoffing, and, while the mother looked on, kissed the baby buffalo. Nobody knows why Buffalo became bull in the jump rope song. History often gets things wrong. So it went through February and March of that year, a feat a week. To much of the town, hearing about these things, it was simply a case of the legend adding to itself, doing what legends do. To Russell and Piper McNabb, it was a case of boosting their importance even higher in the eyes of the other kids. Was it not at the brother's direction that Maniac McGee performed these deeds? And who, after all, is the more amazing, the lion or the tamer? As for Maniac, he understood early on that he was being used for the greater glory of Piper and Russell. He also understood that without him, they would not be going to school every day. For the McNabs, there was nothing free about public education. A tuition had to be paid. Every week, Maniac paid it. And besides, he loved to meet the challenges they cooked up for him. And then one day, they gave him the most perilous challenge of all they dared him to go into the East End. Chapter 38. The witnesses, there were twice 15 this time, went with him as far as Hector Street. They halted at the curb. He crossed the street and went on alone. Piper megaphoned after him. Maniac, come back. We was just kidding. You don't have to. Maniac just waved and went on. He knew he should be feeling afraid of these East Enders, these so-called black people, but he wasn't. It was himself he was afraid of, afraid of any trouble he might cause just by being there. It was the day of the worms, that first almost warm after the rainy night day in April, when you bolt from your house to find yourself in a world of worms. They were as numerous here in the East End as they had been in the West. The sidewalks, the streets, the very places where they didn't belong. Forlorn, marooned on concrete and asphalt, no place to burrow. April's orphans. Once, when he was little in Holidaysburg, he had gone along with his toy wheelbarrow, carefully lifting them with a borrowed kitchen fork until the barrel was full, then dumped them in Mr. Snavely's compost pile. And sure as the worms followed the rain, the kids followed the worms. West End, East End, they had poured from their houses onto the cool, damp sidewalks, and if they gave the worms any notice, it was only when they squashed one underfoot. And so as Maniac moved to the East End, he felt the presence of not one but two populations, both occupying the same territory, yet each unmindful of the other, one yelping and playing and chasing and laughing, the other lost and silent and dying by the millions. Yo, fish belly. Maniac snapped too. He glanced at a street sign. He was four blocks from Hector, deep in the East. Mars Bar came dip-jiving toward him, taller than before, bigger, but still scowling. Hey, fish, thought you was gone. Maniac turned to face him fully. Mars Bar did not stop till he was inside Maniac's phone booth of space, inches from his face. They locked eyes, levelly. Maniac thinking, I must be growing too, he said. I'm back. The scowl fearsened. Maybe nobody told you. I'm badder than ever. I'm getting badder every day. I'm also afraid to wake up in the morning, he leaned in closer, because of how bad I might have got overnight. Maniac smiled, nodded. Yeah, you're bad, Mars. He gave a sniff. His smile went a little smirky. And I'm getting so bad myself, I think I must be half black. Mars' eyes bulged. She backed off. The scowl collapsed, and he howled with laughter. His buddies, who were hanging back, stared dumbly. As Mars unwound from his laugh and fit, he studied Maniac up and down, aware, too, that Maniac was studying him. When he could speak again, he said, Still them raggedy clothes, huh, fish? He lifted one foot, posed. I seen you looking. Like them kicks? Just got them. Maniac nodded. Nice. They were more than nice. They were beautiful. The best. 
yes, the baddest sneaks he had ever seen, way better than anything Grayson could have afforded. I forgot to tell you something else, too, Fish. What's that? I'm fast. I mean, faster. I've been working out. Got my new boss kicks. He sprinted in place, arms and legs pistoning to a blur. He stopped. He jabbed a finger at McNabb's nose, pressed it, flattening the soft end of it. See? Guess you were right. Now at least you got a black nose. He laughed. They both laughed. Everybody laughed. Then Mars turned scowly again, saying, But you ain't black enough or bad enough to beat the Mars, man. We gonna race, honky donkey. The race was set up on Plum Street, the long level block between Ash and Jackson. By the time they were ready, half the kids in the East End were there, from the tiniest pipsqueaks to high schoolers. The little kids ran races of their own from curb to curb. The bigger kids shouldered blasters from the dug into their jeans for coins to bet with. For the first time since last fall, mothers opened windows and leaned out from second stories. Traffic was detoured from both ends of the block. No one could find string for the finish, so a second-story mother dropped down a spool of bright pink thread. Another problem was the start. First, they had to find chalk to draw the starting line. When they did, nobody could see, seem to draw, draw it straight. The result? A stack of starting lines creeping up the street till someone brought out a yardstick and did it right. The next problem came when the starter, Bump Gilliam, who was also Mars Bar's best pal, called, Get ready! And someone in the crowd yelled, That ain't what you say. You say take your mark. Well, everybody jumped into it then. There was shoving and jawing and almost a fistfight over the proper way to start a race. Finally, there was a compromise and Bump called, Get ready on your mark. At which point someone else called, Go Mars! And Bump turned and snarled, Shut up! When the starter starts, there's no noise. So naturally, someone else called, Smoke a Mars! And then came, Waste a Mars! And do the honk, barman! And they might still be calling to this day had not a single voice separated itself from the others. Burn em, McGee! It was hands down, laughing and pointing from his perch on the roof of a car. Bump jumped into the let up. Get set, go! And a long last mossy from their weight at the starting line, they went. Even as the race began, even after it began, Maniac wasn't sure how to run it. Naturally, he wanted to win, or at least to do his best. All his instincts told him that. But there were other considerations. Whom he was racing against, and where, and what the consequences might be if he won. These were heavy considerations, heavy enough to slow him down, until the hysterical crowd and the sight of Mars Boar's sneakers' bottoms and the boiling of his own blood ignited his afterburners, and before you could say, Burn him, McGee, he was ahead, the pink thread bobbing in his sights. But he never saw his body break the thread. He saw only the face of Mars Bar straining, gasping, unbelieving, losing. They went crazy. They went wild. They went totally bananas. You see him? He turned around. He ran backwards. He did it backwards. He beat him going backwards. Marsbar tried. He shoved Bump. You started too fast. I wasn't ready. He shoved the thread holders. You moved it up so he could win. I was gaining on him. He shoved Maniac. You bumped me. You got a false start. You cheated. But his protest drowned in the pandemonium. Why did I do it? Was all Maniac could think. He hadn't even realized it until he crossed the line, and he regretted it instantly. Wasn't it enough just to win? Did he have to disgrace his opponent as well? Had he done it deliberately to pay Mars Bars for all his nastiness? To show him up and shut him up once and for all? His only recollection was a feeling of sheer joyful exuberance. Himself in celebration, shouting, Amen! in the Bethany Church, bashing John McNabb's fastballs out of sight, dancing the polka with Grayson. Maybe it was that simple. After all, who asks why otters toboggan down mud banks? But that didn't make it any less stupid or rotten thing to do. The hatred in Mars Bar's eyes was no longer for a white kid in the East End. It was for Jeffrey McGee, period. The crowd surged with him as he made his way westward. It wasn't clear whether they were glad or not that they had won, that they had seen something to set him off. They jostled and jammed and high-fived and jived. For every one who called him White Lightning, two more challenged him to race. Right here, baby, you and me. See who's going to turn his back on who. Maniac kept moving, embarrassed, wishing he could just break out and sprint for the West End, wishing he could duck into the Beals' house and be sanctuaried there and not fear reprisals on them. 
And just then, miraculously, two little hands were worming into his, two familiar voices squealing, Maniac! Maniac! Hester and Lester? He snatched them up, one in each arm. He was on Sycamore Street. There was the house, the door opening. Amanda, Mrs. Beale, smiling to the beat of the band. 39. During the night, March doubled back and grabbed April by the scruff of the neck and flung it into another week or two down the road. When Maniac slipped silently from the house at dawn, the only way he'd ever managed to get away, March pounced with cold and nasty paws. But Maniac wasn't minding. Their reunion had been ecstatic and tearful and nonstop happy. And inside, he was pure July. He was half a block up Sycamore before he stopped tiptoeing. Minutes later, he crossed Hector. The streets were dry. An occasional scrap of chewed rawhide was all that remained of the worms. Hours later, Russell and Piper spotted him three blocks off. Maniac, you're alive. We thought they got you. We thought they slit your throat. We thought they strangled you and pulled your tongue out. We thought they chopped your head off and, and, and boiled you. Yeah, boiled you. And drunk your blood. Yeah, and drunk your brains. Yeah, don't drink brains, you moron meatball. Yeah, you do. Brains are like milkshakes, like Dairy Queen. You can drink them with a straw. You can hear them sloshing if you shake your head hard enough. Listen. Hey, get off my head. Hey, help! They were off and running. Maniac couldn't help laughing. In spite of their twisted, ludicrous impressions of EastEnders, the concern and the tears in their eyes had been genuine. They had really missed him. They had really been afraid for him. Two houses away, he could hear the thump, almost feel it. And Father George McNabb's voice, Lay him down easy, I said, easy, followed by Son John. This isn't easy enough? Thump, followed by a string of curses from George McNabb that fried the cold morning like an egg. The living room was hazy with dust. At the back end of the dining room, they were bringing in the cinder blocks. George and John and a handful of cobras, lugging and grunting them in from the backyard and dumping them onto the floor. Thump, thump. Hey, kid. George McNabb was pointing through the haze. Three months, and he still didn't know his tenant's name. Get your little hide over here. Start lugging these. Maniac waved. Later, gotta go. He shut the door and headed up the street. So, they were really doing it. He had heard them planning it for weeks. Making drawings, buying or stealing, cement trowels, a level, a pillbox, they called it. Once it was done, they'd be ready. Let the revolt begin. Let the rebels, as they called the East Enders, come. Let them bust through the newly installed bars over the plywood on the windows. Let them bust through the steel door. They'll find themselves staring down the barrel of a little surprise. They squabbled over what the surprise should be. Uzis, AK-47, bazooka. Why, Maniac had asked Giant John one day. Why what? Why are you doing all this? To get ready, what else? Well, what do you think's going to happen? What's going to happen? Giant John swatted a squad of roaches from the kitchen table and sat down. What's going to happen is, one of these days, they're going to revolt. Who says? Who cares who says? You think they're going to make an announcement? Maniac tried to picture Amanda and Hester and Lester and Bow Wow storming the barricades. When's all this supposed to happen? John shrugged. You never know. Maybe this summer. He jumped up, grabbed a beer from the fridge, flipped it open. They like to revolt in the summer, make some itchy. They like to overrun the cities. This time we'll be ready. And he told Maniac what he often imagined, lying in bed, the black sweeping across Hector one steaming summer night, torches, chains, blades, guns, war cries, marauding, looting, overrunning the West End, climbing in through smashed windows, doors, looking for whites, bloodthirsty for whites, like Indians in the old days, Indians on a raid. That's what they are. Giant John nodded through thoughtfully. Today's Indians. The cockroach strolling up his pant leg wasn't the only thing making Maniac feel crawly. He shook off the roach. He moved to the center of the kitchen to surround himself with as much space as possible. But other people, he said, I don't hear them talking about revolts. Nobody else wants to make a pillbox. Giant John tilted the last of the beer into his mouth. Maybe when we do, he grinned, they will. That had been weeks before, and now the pillbox was underway, no longer an idea in the backyard, but a reality in the dining room. Now there was no room that Maniac could stand in the middle of and feel clean. Now there was something else in that house, and it smelled worse than garbage and turds.